Hello. I don't mean to, to disappoint anyone in the audience here, but uh, for anyone who came to see practical Android game development, that is actually not going to be the title of this session. We wanted to have a placeholder so that people who were coming to Google I.O. and wanted to learn, who were game developers, could have a way of planning their schedule out before they got here. So we are actually going to be doing something related to a little announcement we did during the keynote. And uh, so once again, this is going to be game services in practice. I'm Dan Galpin, a developer advocate for Android games. I'm Jenny Means. I'm a product manager on the games platform team. I'm Jeong Jung, the tech lead of the game developer experience team. So that being said, this is our second talk on the game services platform. And so what this means is if you haven't listened to the keynote, don't understand what we game services are, don't program, uh, you might want to leave the room because this might not make any sense. All right. Every game begins with an idea, an original idea. And perhaps it's that one in a million idea that carves out a niche on Google Play. So the question is, how do we squeeze as much money out of it as we possibly can? For that, we need a PM. Jenny? So, money. I've heard that seasonal content is, is really the thing on Google Play these days. I think I want angry pumpkins. I want angry fruit fall. Wait, hey guys. I'm so tired of hearing about casual games. How about making a hardcore edition? Uh, no, no, no. My favorite version is the shameless movie tie-in, but I digress. <laughs> the real question is, how do we use Google Play game services best in every facet of the life cycle of the game? From when you're developing, testing, publishing, or updating, uh, and uh, managing your gaming community. We're going to talk about all of these things in the talk. So let's start with development. Uh, and just for a show of hands, in the audience, how many people here are actually developers? All right, we've got the right people here. That's awesome. Uh, all right, despite all that stuff I said earlier, let's quickly review how we set up a game in the Google Play Developer Console. So one path is you upload an APK. And this one is going to be signed with your production signature. So it's pretty much like you would do anything else in your publishing in Google Play. And after that is complete, we notice we have this really cool new tab here that looks like a game controller, sort of. Um, as you can see, I've already been experimenting with one of the samples before I dove into creating my own project, which everyone should do, because experimenting is good, and you'll find out what you don't know. But we're going to add a new game. Then we get to set up the services for our app, which you know doesn't use Google's APIs yet, which makes sense. A lot of people aren't yet, but they should. And uh, then we add the Angry Fruit package name. Ta-da! So going on from there, we end up getting this fabulous dialogue telling us about branding information, which I'm not going to cover. But other people will cover these things in another talk. And then finally, um, after all of this, please, there we are. Ha-ha. <laughs> we now get to the fun part. So what, what we've done now is we've actually extracted from from that APK file, uh, the, the SHA-1 certificate fingerprint that you're, that you're going to be used for that client. And this actually is creating a client on uh, Google's um, apiary dashboard, which is the way, which is the way these things are all signed, the, the code.google.com dashboard. That's an internal name. Um, and uh, note that uh, there's some, we end up getting this full of screen here, which contains this very large client ID and this 12-digit number which is the application ID, and this is what we actually put into the package. So again, not that whole thing. So finally, we end up getting into some code. And very simply, this is our, our manifest file. And, and uh, that is the little section there that contains uh, the app ID that we're, that we're sending to these services. Now notice that we actually have two separate services here. One of them is for app state and the other one is for games. And, and uh, the reason why is AppState obviously has a lot of applications beyond games. And that is the app ID that we're going to place in. Now notice that it is a resource. Uh, and the reason we're doing that is because otherwise Google, uh, the, the uh, Android resource system will actually interpret it as a number. We want it to be a string. 
So don't just put it in the manifest file, and then here we are. There's, there's our app ID and where we put it inside of our resources. So very simply, now we've, set up our, now we've set up our program for launch, except there is one problem here. Because uh, we have a game that'll work with the Play Services API, signed with our release keys, which is what we're going to actually publish. However, no one actually develops an Android game using the release keys, or if you are, you really shouldn't, because you should protect that key store. That is your identity, your digital identity on Google Play. So how do we make it work with the debug key? Well, that's very simply. We go and link another app. And the other app has the same package name as our regular application. And we end up getting a blank value for the SHA-1, because we didn't actually up upload that APK. So where do we get this value from? Well, it depends on what platform you're actually running. Um, we create this automatically for you uh, on uh, you know, Linux, Windows, or Vista Plus, or whatever. Um, the important thing is that, is that you should probably take uh, and actually go through the step of sharing the same debug key store across your developers, because we only allow you to create a limited number of client IDs for your game. So it's a, it's a, it's a good practice to be in any case. And then, um, after all of this, uh, we actually get the SHA fingerprint by using key tool. So now we can take that, that fingerprint dump it back into this new client, and now we are ready. All of, our, and all of our developers will actually be able to develop against Play Services. Now we're in a good place. But what about actually integrating the game's APIs? Jenny, what's the deal with branding? So we've come up with some guidelines to help you integrate the game services and make a really consistent experience for your players. First of all, two very important notes. To be a sort of game services customer, you need to do two things. First of all, you need to use sign-in. And then because signing in without any features is useless, you also need to have achievements. So let's start by looking at sign-in. Because we use Google Plus for our sign-in and our identity, so should you for the branding. We have a very small red G Plus logo you can use, or if you want something bigger, there's a full version with sign-in. In a game context, though, if you just stick that red button somewhere with no explanation, no context. It's kind of confusing. Why would I ever tap that if I'm a player? So we want you to really give an upsell. Explain what you're using it for, what you're going to do with it. Why should the player bother? There's all these great features that are waiting to be unlocked when they sign in. So you know, let them understand that. And this is from Save the Puppies. They did a great job in just making it really clear. You want to collect achievements. You want to compete with your friends. Come right in. For the in-game features themselves, we have icons for each of them that you can use and customize and you know, texture and put in your game's look and feel. You don't have to use them as these flat vectors. And we do provide our own interface for leaderboards and achievements. Now, we ask that you put in a way to get to that interface, but we really thoroughly encourage you to mess about with our data APIs and customize skin, use the data in your own game's UI as much as you like. If you want to put a little button to bring up our UI, you should use our branding to make it really clear to the player what's going to happen and make it a really consistent experience. The controller is the main symbol for this. And as you'll see in the games that are live on the Play Store today, the controller is used a lot to say, this is where the game services are. This is where the cool stuff lives. And if you have a page like a menu which has you know, achievements and leaderboards and maybe even multiplayer, you don't want to put like three controllers. That means absolutely nothing. So you can use the controller as like a contextual key and the individual feature icons for the links. Let's look at that in practice. So you can see, as with the handy game screenshot we have on the second, on the bottom there, they've used the controller as like tying things in and they've used the individual icons with completely their own look and feel there to launch our UIs. You don't have to be boring. Just keep one really simple principle in mind. We don't want people to be confused Surprised, upset, or angry? Uh, angry? I would be angry if I played a game for hours, and right at the end of all that play, I'm told, hey, maybe you could sign in through some obscure menu somewhere. And I've, none of that progress gets synced. None of that counted, because I wasn't signed in. So you know, keep, people, keep people nice, and give them you know, reason to use the services and not get angry at you, because that's bad. All right. All right. So, 
And of course, you can find all of these branding guidelines and assets in our developer documentation. So let's, let's go back to our friend, the uh, wrathful watermelon. Wrathful ninja watermelon. Oh, yeah. So we're ready to go, aren't we, Dan? We've, we've got our game. It's glorious. It's original. It's creative. It's, it's ready for beta testing. Wait. We have a lot of fans in Korea. Also, half of our testers are international. I want to test your butchin quiet churn as well as an angry foot. That is a great point. So let's talk about localization. Oh, wait. There's an error on that slide, Dan. That's better. Yeah. Thank you. So I wanted to walk you guys through some of our really neat localization support. To localize your game's integration, it's pretty simple. You add languages in the console, provide translations, and we do all the hard work for you. We pipe it all through to all the relevant places. If you go to the root of your game configuration and hit Add Translations, you can select your languages, and, and off you go. Now, remember, once you've added a language here, you're really committing to providing translations for all the strings that you send us, all the achievement names, et cetera. And you know, we don't want you to tick all the boxes so that it looks like you're really localized, but not actually do it. You can also change the default locale here. So if you don't want English to be the default, you can do that. For a leaderboard's achievements, translations are super, super simple. You just when your game is in draft mode, you just type in the new title and go. If you don't do it, you get a nice big error. So it's pretty clear what's going on there. I also want to talk about leaderboard formatting. We have this really nifty stuff here that's really, really nice for localization. And it has other applications too. First of all, you can have currency leaderboards. And you can set that to a number of international currencies. So we use a symbol for that currency when we display the score. You might think, though, that for international currencies, you can just put the local currency in for each locale, and it will format the score locally. However, that is not the case. So if you set your score to yen here, if I go back to US English, it will be yen. And you might not want that. So this is a really good use case for our custom score formatting. Not the only one by a long way, but it's uh, one I wanted to highlight here. If I wanted to use dollars in America and yen in Japan, I can configure an integer and add a custom unit. Once I've done that, I've committed to translating the plurals for that language, for that unit. American English, it's easy. Japanese, I've decided just to use the symbol because you know, I want to make sure I get it right. So I'm just going to do that. And as you'll notice, the plural options were different there. We're pretty comprehensive about that. So if you go to a language such as Polish, you'll see we ask you to pluralize all the different plural cases in that language. So if you're putting in translation requests to an external team, you might want to bear that in mind. You can also use this as a guideline when you're designing your leaderboards in the first place. It might spark off a few ideas. You can be pretty creative as well, but there's a couple of constraints. It's always a suffix, and in right to left languages, it will be a prefix. So what do you need? When you've added a language, you're saying, I'm going to translate all this stuff. We make it pretty easy in that if you're testing, the descriptions can be optional. And the leaderboard units, as you saw, you can change it around between different languages. So you can have a custom one in English and just plain old integer for the rest of them. If we don't have the unit, then we'll just leave it off. A couple of nuances as well. So you know in the Play Store, they have localized image assets. We do not have that yet. So make sure that your images that you use for you know, achievement icons, leaderboard icons, and so on are language independent. Otherwise, it looks kind of weird. You also want to make sure that, you know, although we have a, you have a store entry and you've configured translations for what appears in the Play Store app on other, peop on other countries, this is unrelated to what appears in the game service in-game. So if you've set all those translations, you may have to just click them across. And also, if your in-game locales are different from the ones you have configured, there will be a slight mismatch there. So there could be cases where your game supports different languages to the ones you've put on the Play Store config. Some people do that. We also do some pretty cool fallbacks. So if you, know, you have a Canadian French player, but you've only got French French translations, we'll do that. We won't make them go English, which is really nice. All right, so I think we're ready to test. We're good. How do we get some beta testers? All right, so uh, again, uh, you know, to make things clear, um, game services in the console are actually separate from the regular Google Play developer console. And, and part of the reason why is that obviously game services covers multiple platforms. And, um, and so when you're actually talking about beta testers, you're actually talking about beta testers that could be for any of these platforms. So we have a separate API, a second separate place in the services to actually set that up. And it's very simple. 
You just literally go to Play Services and you click Add Testers. And this is important because, of course, only testers can test unpublished games. Okay? You kind of knew that one. Um, we're kind of smart for you. Um, we also make sure that only uh, testers can receive uh, multiplayer invites. And so you won't accidentally leak a really cool multiplayer game that you're working on just because you are uh, testing it. Um, another thing, of course, uh, that's really useful for developers and was asked very, very early on is, please give me the ability to reset achievements so that you can retest them over and over again. And uh, finally, uh, you might want to reset scores on leaderboards. And if you're doing multiplayer, you might actually want to eliminate all your multiplayer invites or rooms. So, uh, you know, how do your testers do this? You know, do you need to give each one of your testers access to the Google Play Developer Console? Ugh. No, actually the good news is that you can build a website so your testers can reset their own achievements, leaderboards, and multiplayer rooms, and Jay Wong will show us how to do it. Wow, it's finally my turn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how do we build a website like this where testers can get reset their, their game data? We must start with registering our website on the Play Console. Go to the Linked Apps tab, click Link Another App button, and choose Web. Then enter basic info. Oh. And enter basic information, like the launch URL, save and continue. And click authorize your app now button. Otherwise, Google cannot verify API calls from your site. Enter basic printing information. This is only required once per project. And enter the host name. Only API calls from this host will be authorized. And finally, you're given a client ID. But unlike Android apps, you need the whole client ID string to get all the tokens from your website. So it's time to see how you actually build a test website with the client ID. Users must be signed into Google to use the game service API. So let's add a Google Plus sign-in button button to our website first. This is the standard Google Plus sign-in code with a modified scope for the game service. And you want to specify the client ID here, like this. Also, handle the sign-in result with a callback function like this. And this is a very simple version. It hides the sign-in button when it was successful, and it logs the error when there were some problems. Now the user is authorized and ready to call game service APIs. As an example, I'm gonna show you how to reset an achievement, but other reset methods are pretty much the same. Once the sign-in is done, you're given this special object called GAPI or GAPI, which is provided by Google API JavaScript library. Oh, I remembered it. <laughs> it provides many functions, but especially this clients that request function is very handy when you make generic API calls. You specify an API path with the, um, in this case, we are specifying a path to reset an achievement with the achievement ID and specify a calling method like post, put, get, or delete, and a callback function. And it's done. How simple is that? So now the achievement will be reset on the tester's device. Then, is that right? Uh, not exactly. Uh, so uh, right now, we've told the server, great, reset the achievement. So the achievement has now been reset on the server, but it actually hasn't synced to the device yet. And it doesn't sync immediately there unless you go and display RUI. Um, so if you're not displaying our UI, you're going to want to have the ability for your testers to bring up the UI within your application. What if I don't want to build a website, Dan? All right, all right. That's, that's a good point. So how, how, many of you don't want, how many people here don't want to build a website for this? Okay, all right. So, so the good news is that you can actually reset them on the device, too. Um, you're, it's a little tricky because you actually have to go through the same flow. Um, the good news is that we actually offer you some APIs that help. Uh, first of all, you're going to need up to two additional permissions. Uh, the great thing about using uh, Play Game Services is that you don't actually need to have internet permission or accounts permission. We handle all of that in the background for you. Um, but if you're going to want to reset achievements for your debuggers, uh, for your de testers, excuse me, in, uh, in a debug version of your application, you're going to need these two additional permissions potentially. And after sign-in is complete, then you can get the current account name. Now, uh, what's great about this is that um, do you notice these two things in the, in the bottom are just very simple calls, and that's because they're taking advantage of something called base game activity, which is a wrapper for our client library that handles a lot of the boilerplate code for handling errors right for you. And uh, it's part of Game Helper, 
And you can actually uh, download this off of the developer site, and it gives you a lot of insights into handling all of these cases uh, in Google Play uh, game services. Very, very cool. So then we just have to get the auth token. So uh, now the one thing that's interesting about getting the auth token is we want to make sure that the scope that we're using, that we're trying to fetch, matches the scope that we're signing in with. So for example, if you wanted to use both the Cloud Save APIs for App State or the, uh, and, and the Games APIs, those are actually two separate scopes. So you're going to want to make sure they match, otherwise the system will go and prompt you and say, ah, you don't have a credential that matches these scopes, so we need to, get, we need to fetch that. So it's very, very easy to do that. If you're using uh, base game activity slash game helper, you can just call get scopes, and it'll nicely return that for you. If you're not, that is how you construct them. Then we just fetch the token from Google Auth Util. Now, you note here we're not handling important exceptions like uh, user recoverable auth exception. After all, these are just for your testers. They'll see the log messages, right? Uh, all, in all seriousness, no, you know, there, there, there is a little bit of more work to be done here. And there are some things that can go wrong. First of all, as I said before, your scope must, must match exactly, otherwise you'll get a user recoverable auth exception. And of course, your token may have expired. So there's nothing, when you actually call get token, there is nothing that is part of that call that goes and automatically refreshes the token. It's a pretty low level API. But once you've done all of this work, you can pretty much do the exact same thing we did on the server. Make a little HTTP client, call, call that REST API, and boom, we've now reset the achievement. Now, even though we've done this on the device, we still have to go and call the game services um, uh, UI for displaying achievements in order to force the client to pull those down. Uh, it's also just as easy to call the management API if you want to reset scores. Once you have that token, the world is your oyster. So, um, uh, and again, you'll want to invalidate the cache. You can also do it by calling one of our APIs here and simply saying force reload on all of these things. So very, very easy to make sure that you continue to test leaderboards and achievements uh, again and again and again. So now we're ready to publish. It's time for the PM to take all the credit. This is my favorite part. Pushing stuff live, making, making it out of there, fixing all the bugs, or making people do it for me. <laughs> so let's get our game out there. But there's a few things just to bear in mind before you go live, before you hit the big red switch, so to speak. First of all, assets. We've seen this in testing that people often forget to change their placeholder assets. You know, you need to make sure that you have all the assets there and that you update them from placeholders and, you know, don't just have 512 by 512 insert image here going out there in the wild. That's not so good. Our uh, console does give you a nice little checklist when you go to publish saying, hey, we're missing this stuff. So it's pretty simple to make sure you've got that all right. And if you had descriptions that were missing or placeholder translations like walk, walk, walk or something, you probably want to change those too. So as Dan mentioned, you know, we have two different kinds of publishing. You can publish both to the services and to Google Play. Now, in which order? Well, pretty simple, right? You want to make sure the services work before you actually upload an APK that calls those APIs. If you do it the other way around, things break. Breaking isn't good. The, um, the user experience is, you know, pretty bad if you put stuff out there that doesn't break. So we also want to make sure that you publish it first so you can go through the validation checklist because there will be stuff that goes wrong. And you want to make sure there's no validation errors in that process. So once you are published, we have a nice little treat in store for you. As you get more users, you will get badges. We love badges. Badges are great. So uh, you unlock some achievements of your very, very own. And you can get a leaderboard badge, an achievement badge, and a multiplayer badge if you use all three in the Play Store, right there. And your apps will stand out, and people will know that you've got these really cool services there. However, they're not just given out because you had the leaderboards in the config, or you know, we don't snoop your APK and check your call in the APIs from there. We actually look at how much your feature is being used, and when we reach a certain threshold, we will give you a badge. So you, know, you have to actually integrate it. It's not just a token thing that you can do to get more, more eyeballs in the store. And so far, we've really just been talking about the one app, Angry Fruit, as we all now love and will dream about for days to come. But what if, what if the smash hit Angry Fruit is 99 cents and you know, it's just not really getting that much traction? It's just not doing well. And we want to try and launch maybe a free version. Well, the good news is we support that super easily. We basically just link all the games together. How do we do that? I'm sure you can guess by now, 
we go to the linked apps section of the console, and we select link another app. You can link up to 20 different apps here, including your web management app that, you, that Jay Wong showed you how to write. And once you've got it full of apps, what's in common? You know, we've got all these apps, but how do we know which one's which and, and what's going on there? So achievements on leaderboards within the same game configuration are global, so to speak. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. There's also multiplayer, because our system basically sees them all as one game. So they all play multiplayer together. That's too much work. And besides, uh, the free version doesn't have the levels. So um, we have a way of handling that. So first of all, you're going to want to prevent people who don't know each other from auto-matching. And the way to do this is to use the variant, uh, which you can do when you're actually building your configuration for rooms. Uh, but we actually also want people who uh, know each other to be able to invite people regardless of whether they actually have the game, because it's one way of directing people to the game. So what we suggest you do is just handle this gracefully. Uh, you know, consider an opportunity to upsell someone to the premium version or to the new version of the game. And we have a lot more information about multiplayer coming along in, in sessions that are going to be in this room. Okay, so just stay tuned here and you'll learn all sorts of great stuff about how to implement multiplayer. And also, the advanced game topics talk talks about more than just multiplayer, but has a lot of really, really great info about how to implement games. So. There are a few cases where you might want to prefer one version of your game over others, however, when someone gets invited to it. Um, Jay Wong, how do we set that up? OK. So in the multiplayer invitation you saw in the previous talk, we send the users to the Play Store if, if they don't have the game. And if there are multiple versions, we let you decide which store entry to send the users to with the checkbox on the Play Console. How about the Apache case? I mean, what if the user is a super fan and has more than one version installed? In that case, when they hit play, we will launch the one you added most, most recently on the play console. That's really good. I want to be able to do that and tell people which game to launch. That's, that's really important. So in terms of multiple games, let's talk a little bit about sequels. So you know, it's Thanksgiving fairly soon, I guess, and I want to really, that Angry Fruit 4 game is That's stuck in my brain. I really want to make that happen. And it's not quite the same as the original game. You know, we're adding more content. We want more achievements, more leaderboards, and brand new graphics for everything. But how do I do that? It's simple. I add new resources in just the same way as I added them in the first place. As many as you want, as long as you go under the limit that the console gives you. And you know, it's pretty much exactly the same. And I'll just walk you through how that works when you've got a game that's live and a game that's in development at the same time. So your game out there, Angry Fruit, has three achievements, and your users are super, super happy. And you know they want some more, so you, you add some more. Brilliant. And at the same time, you're going to change the visuals on the existing achievements. Now, while your version is out there and your new achievements are in draft mode, Live users will just see the original three. They won't see anything of the new stuff you've uploaded. However, your testers see everything. And they will see your in-progress graphics and mock you for it. Now, once you've hit publish, everybody gets to see all the achievements and all the icons. And that's everybody. So if the original Angry Fruit users have the achievement UI, they will see all the new achievements as well as the original ones. But they can't unlock the new ones because you never told them to. You know, the game doesn't have the calls. The APK doesn't have the code in there to do it. And in order to unlock it, they need to get the new game. So that's a really great opportunity for an upsell. Don't you think? You, you've got this achievement list and a description. Make the description say, only available in the brand new smash hit Angry Fruit 4. Or you can upgrade the original APK and add in the calls to unlock the new achievements in there. But you know what? There is something that I cannot change. Let me show you. So before an achievement is published, you can freely change its type. A standard achievement can be changed to an incremental achievement or to a hidden achievement. But once you make a choice and publish it, the type becomes permanent, permanent and cannot be changed anymore. Leaderboards have something that becomes permanent after publishing, too. Let's look at this one. The top player who remarkably resembles me is smiling because he's winning on a public leaderboard. 
He's the best player in the world, though there are only nine players at the moment. <laughs> However, if the developer changes the leaderboard ordering, the player will suddenly find itself at the bottom of the leaderboard and won't be able to smile anymore. <laughs> Basically, we don't want to take away something a user already earned. If a, if a player has under a rank, he or she must be able to keep it until someone else beats his or her score. In the same vein, you can't delete published leaderboards or achievements. We will apply the same thinking when we introduce new resource types in the future. So looking at that leaderboard, those two top scores look really suspicious. And they're also not wearing glass. Hmm, that's right. They look suspicious, which makes me introduce not the next subject, managing. Angry for fault went totally viral and began to attack cheaters, as Dan pointed out. So how should you deal with them? Coming back to this leaderboard, we now believe the first and the second place are cheaters. We want to hide them from the game. So let's build an admin website with the hide player function. Hiding a player is really simple. This short JavaScript code using the gap object is everything you need to write. The, the hide method is a plain RESTful API where hidden players are represented as a group resource in your game. So basically, you're posting two new entries to the resource. And for that, you only need the, your own application ID, which you already know, and the player ID you want to hide. Where do you get the player IDs of the abusive users? They are included in leaderboard score responses. After calling the, the hide method with, with the two cheaters IDs, they are hidden and the leaderboard is cleansed. Wait, 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 wait. You just hid my score. But I'm not a cheater. I, I spent all night, like, she's, like she's a hard, 24 she's a hours player. playing your game. I yeah. Mean, fix it. Oh, don't worry, because hiding is not banning. Hidden users can still play the game, and their, score, their scores are still recorded in the Google server. They just won't appear the game's leaderboards. Let me explain why this matters again with an example. It turns out Jenny wasn't actually a cheater, as she said. Um, she just loves their game so much, and she got disappointed because you hid her scores. She may post something on Reddit unless you do something to her. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why you need the unhide player API. And you only need to call this simple method to revive her scores. Her scores will be restored normally within a few hours. And as I explained earlier, hidden player list is a list resource in your application. So what this call does is, is, is essentially deleting a player from the list. But here's the problem. How do you know her player ID? Most players don't know their player IDs because we don't have any UI to show them. So it's not like she can tell you, my player ID is this, this, this. Please give me back my scores. But don't worry, there are not only one, but two ways to figure out player's IDs. First, you provide this hidden, hidden, list hidden players API. Calling this will return all hidden players public profiles, including their names and player IDs. And again, this is just getting the hidden player's resource. So if the innocent player's name is found in the list, like in this case, bingo. Unfortunately, um, there's a corner case. Can you guess what? when there are multiple players with the same name. Since the hidden player list doesn't contain any personal information like email addresses except for their names, it's impossible to distinguish multiple, multiple people with the same name. And this is why I previously said that there are two ways. What's the other way? You can find players' IDs on their Google Plus profile pages. Let's take a look at Jenny's one. You see this long number in the URL? Yeah, that's really long. <laughs> this is her player ID. So you can either visit the player's Google Plus profile page yourself or ask her to do so and grab the player ID there. 
But just don't use that one because I'm not actually a cheater, so don't hide me. After a few hours, Jenny has returned. Plus, if she got a higher score while she was hidden, the new score is shown when she returns. By the way, um, since this community management API is just a plain, easy to use, restful API, then can anybody use it to hide the people they dislike? For example, someone? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Because users must sign into Google to use this API, Google knows who's calling it and serves to only a limited set of people the project owner permitted. Then how do you grant the permission to members of your team? Some of you may be familiar with this. On the Play console, you can invite, to, uh, invite others to be members of your, your project team, like as in this screenshot. Only these members, and including yourself, will have the permission. Others won't. And this is how you manage your gamer community. So, we've just walked you through the development, test, and publishing cycle, and talked about how you manage your gamer community. You now have all the information at your fingertip to set up and publish your million dollar game franchise. And remember, all the sample code is available on the developers.google.com documentation for games. And as Dan mentioned, there's talks on the game services in this room coming up after this, so please come back. And we'll be in office hours in the Play Sandbox upstairs if you want to ask us any questions about games. And of course, in that sandbox, there are hands-on stations where you can get to play more than 16 of our games. And try them all out. Let us know what you think. Thank you thank for you. coming. Yeah, thank you.